on the foot plate of a Stania 280 8F locomotive number 48773. And this morning we're going to take the opportunity of showing you and illustrating the workings of the back plate fittings of this locomotive. First of all I'd like to move across and show you the two dampers. These are operated by pulling up vertically and what is actually happening is that the grate of the firebox has two plates, two vertical plates at the front and the rear of the firebox which allow by opening them an opening of 90 degrees to allow the passage of air underneath the firebox. The inside one is the trailing damper, the one that is vertical at the back of the firebox and the outside one is the forward damper operating at the front of the firebox. The purpose of this, as we say, is to increase the airflow, to increase the combustion of the coals on the fire. If we move away from the damper and come to the first dial, we see that this is the steam heat gauge dial. It tells us the pounds in uh, the pressure in pounds of the steam that is put through the coaches generally up to a maximum of approximately 50 pounds for an eight coach, eight coach train and it is operated by the steam heat valve spindle the engine being cold there's no pressure on so you won't hear any steam but we would open the steam heat valve until we got the appropriate poundage pressure of steam required to the number of coaches in the train and this would run through we would shut it off probably about a quarter of a mile to a mile before the locomotive reached the end of its journey so that when we came to disconnect it there would be no pressure going through the pipe at the front or rear of the locomotive. As we work across the back plate you see here just like a kettle the locomotive basically being a horizontal kettle the boiler having the water horizontally as distinct from your kettle in the kitchen at home but on the kettle at the kitchen at home you also have a uh, mirror image of what the water level is in that kettle. On the locomotive we have two and if I slowly open the drain cock you will see that the water which is right at the top of the boiler at the present time will start to run down and we check our water level by then slowly closing it and watching the water rise up to the top of the glass. The reason that we have two gauge glasses and frames is purely one of safety. On occasion the glass can shatter and we can immediately take hold of the shutdown cocks, close them off, shut down lever, close them off and work on the alternative one. This enables us to change the glass when we get to our destination. We move across further, we come to the lever operating the blower. Now the blower is a perforated ring in the smoke box either just above the blast pipe or it's cast integrally with the chimney. When we open the blower steam goes through a lot of holes in these rings up through the chimney and in draws the fire pulls the fire through the tubes by creating a vacuum in the firebox. This enables us to increase our steam pressure more quickly get rid of smoke at the chimney and also when we're running through cuttings or into a tunnel ensure that the fire continues to be drawn through the tubes out of the chimney and there is no chance of the fire blowing back into the cab. Moving across further to the left we have a sanding lever. If we pull the lever to the left the sanders at the front of the driving wheels in the forward direction of travel will operate they're steam operated, pushing sand through to the front of the wheels in the event of there being leaves on the line or ice or particularly wet and slippery. And equally if we move them if we move the handle across to the right, we are sanding the rear drivers for when the locomotive is running tender first. Moving across again, 
Um, we come to the drain cock lever which is on this left hand side. This opens uh, passages in the steam chest and the valve in the cylinder in the valve chest to allow the condensate that has formed overnight to be blown out of the either side of the front of the engine through the drain cocks to ensure that we have dry steam at all times in these areas. The operation is simply to allow when we start the locomotive in the morning the steam to blow through the drain cocks for possibly a third of a mile and then we would push the lever forward and the drain cocks would be closed and kept there whilst we're running. If we were stopping at a station for a particularly prolonged period of time we would open the cocks as we started off for maybe one or two seconds we would let the steam blow through and again we would immediately close the drain cocks. If we now look at the centre lever, the regulator, we can relate this very much to a car accelerator. As we raise the regulator, so it is the equivalent of putting the foot on the accelerator by increasing the amount of energy, in this case steam, to drive the machine. The biggest difference between the operation of the steam regulator on a locomotive and the car accelerator is that when you accelerate, put your foot down on the car pedal, you get an instantaneous response. With a steam locomotive you get a delayed response and with the amount of latent power that you have in the locomotive you have to be extremely careful in the speed and the manner in which you operate the regulator. What is actually happening is that you are opening the regulator valve which will either be in the dome or the front by the header in the smoke box by the tube plate on the locomotive and steam is allowed to travel either side of the main steam pipes down into the valve chest. They pass through, it passes through ports there and works either on the front or the back of a double acting piston. As you open the regulator it takes time for it to travel the steam and work on the piston head and therefore what one must ensure is never happens is that there is a quick large opening of the regulator when an excessive amount of steam will work on the piston head and cause the locomotive wheels to slip. And in many cases the general operation when starting with a large train is to raise the regulator until the locomotive starts moving, close it immediately, reopen it again for the simple reason that it will take 50 to 100 times more energy to start a train from static, get the wheels moving, than it will when the train is rolling. So it is firm, it is constant, but it is slow operation when you open it. When you close it, no problem, you can slam the regulator down onto the block without any problems whatsoever. So regulator is the equivalent of the car accelerator. In relation to the regulator we have the reverser. The reverser is the equivalent of the car's gearbox. Instead of having a gate and moving one, two and across the gate three, four or five here we have a horizontal rod carrying two piston valves in the valve chest. If you can imagine in your car you have two, four, six, eight pistons, either vertical or maybe V. Here we have two piston valves, horizontal, still with rings on like a piston. And in the mid-gear position you will see that there is a square nut opposite two screws right in the middle of the actual cutoff uh, figures themselves. In mid-gear position when the steam comes down the main steam pipe these two piston valves stop the steam entering the cylinder and working on the piston. As you will see the reverser is now in the mid-gear position with the nut opposite the two screws in the middle of the plate itself and that indicates 
that the two piston valves are covering the totally covering the entry ports for steam into the cylinder and therefore the locomotive will not move the equivalent if you like of what we term static neutral as if you've got the neutral in your gearbox in your car on this particular locomotive if we now move the reverser into forward gear and take it to the extremity of its travel which is approximately 75 percent cut off we are now in the equivalent of a first gear in a car and what has happened is that we have allowed the valves to move to the fullest extent of their travel horizontally this now allows steam to come through the entry port either at the front or the rear of the cylinder and work on the head of the piston or the reverse of the head of the piston for 75 percent of its fixed travel. Whilst we are able to alter the length of travel of the piston valves, the piston in the cylinder has a fixed travel and so I would repeat that live steam is now working on the piston head or the reverse of the piston head being a double acting piston for 75 percent of the fixed travel of the piston. If once we start moving we pull the reverser back towards mid gear and let us say we are now at something like 55 percent cut off exactly the same argument holds good we are now allowing live steam onto the piston face or the reverse for only 55 percent of its travel and therefore the equivalent if you like of second gear in a car we are not putting a greater as great a demand for steam for the coal for water at 55 percent as we did at 75 percent and if we were running main line we would tend to depending on the gradient continually move the reverser either forwards or backwards to minimize the amount of steam being taken to run the locomotive or the train economically and on many occasions locomotives would run at 25 or 20 percent cut off allowing the expansion of the steam as the steam cools down to do the majority of the work in the locomotive as distinct from burning coal and necessary taking unnecessary steam causing the fireman to work too hard by being if you will in the wrong cutoff position or as you would with a car the wrong gear you would know when a car with a car went to change up by the sound of the engine you will know with a locomotive by the exhaust beats the sound from the chimney when you need to either pull the reverser back to shorten the cutoff or if going up a, a, a steep gradient wind the reverser back to a longer longer cutoff so that we are able to again maximize the economical use of the locomotive if we now look at the braking system this particular locomotive is vacuum braked and if the locomotive was in steam we would open a small ejector ejector and what would happen is that the dial here the needle would move round to approximately 21 inches of vacuum in this position the brakes of the locomotive and the train are fully off when we are braking we make a partial application of the brake and destroy part of the vacuum so we would take this handle which is now in the off position move it across to the left hand side slowly and generally bring the needle down to 15 inches of vacuum we would drop approximately 7 inches at this point the brake blocks would begin to bind on the locomotive tender and train and we could then apply further the brake without 
any cause of jerking in the train so that we reduce speed to whatever the requirement of the line is at that time. To again release the brakes we would push the brake lever back to off and because the ejector is constantly running automatically the vacuum would build up again to 21 inches. However, if we had an emergency application or we had to brake very sharply for a very good reason we also have a large ejector and if we had to make a fast quick application possibly down to 10 or less inches of vacuum it would take longer by only using the small ejector to release the brakes on a long train and we might even come to a stop so to obviate that possibility we would turn the large ejector on as well and the brakes would blow up that much more quickly we would then close that as soon as we'd reached 21 and again the locomotive or train would run on the small ejector coming into a station again 15 inches approximately to begin with on vacuum a little bit more a little bit less to bring a smooth stop and in the station we would take the brake handle right over to the on position brakes the vacuum would come down to zero and the train would be held safely in the station or terminus so vacuum brake zero the brakes are on fully 21 inches the brakes are off fully and we run with the small ejector open. We also have a handbrake on the tender used obviously in conjunction with the vacuum brake when we're at a station when we're stationary or like this locomotive has been stabled overnight and simply it takes the brakes on manually to undo it as with all things anti-clockwise and put the tender brake on clockwise the locomotive will be left in this position overnight. Whilst we're in this area you will see shut water and open on the plate behind this lever and if we come across to this side of the locomotive you see again an identical lever and plate. By opening or pushing the lever down we allow water to come out of the tender and work down towards the injectors which are either side of the locomotive. This is the method by which we refill the boiler when by using the amount of steam the water level drops. We would open the feed valve. We would then use the control valve to control the feed of the water into the injector and once we saw water running out of the injector we would open the steam valve and again because the locomotive is cold you won't hear anything but by turning it one full turn we would allow water and steam to blend together in the injector work up the side of the boiler through a feed a pipe through a one-way clack valve the pressure at the clack valve is higher than the working pressure in the boiler and we're able to refill the boiler to the le whatever predetermined level we require. Point to bear in mind here is that steam necessarily needs something to work on. We must have water on first before we open the steam injector valve and by the same definition we turn off the steam injector valve first before we close the control valve. We can work either from the control valve or from the feed valve once we've set it but we'll pull that shut for the moment because if by chance you are opening the steam valve at a platform while you were stationary and hadn't got any water going through there is a very grave risk of scalding anybody walking on the platform. So the critical area of operation is water first then steam steam off first then the water off. At the moment reverting back to the water level you will see that we fill this boiler right up last night to ensure that the residual heat and as it was still making steam we always maintain some water in the boiler for the next crew coming along when they light up the next day.
the most important operation of the locomotive apart from the safety and not passing a signal at danger is to ensure that at all times we have water in sight in the glass and therefore it is vitally necessary that the footplate crew fully appreciate the gradients on which the locomotive is working. For instance, if we had a water level showing here, in this, just under middle at the, uh, at the moment, if we were going up a gradient, that water level would rise and possibly go out of sight. Conversely, if we've gone over the top of a summit and we drop down, where we have water level almost out of sight, that will drop possibly two-thirds of a glass as the water goes to the front of the boiler. At all times we need to ensure there is a water supply on top of the inner wrapper of the firebox. And inside the firebox we have two fusible plugs in the center of the inner wrapper. They are brass screwed in plugs with a lead core. If at any time the inner wrapper gets so hot by water not being present, um, it will enable the lead cores to melt what little water may be swilling about will tend to come down to try and put the fire out but at the same time there is a tremendous risk of a blowback into the cab so whether we run out of steam or not that may be an embarrassment but within five or ten minutes we would normally be off again and running we, we must ensure that at all times wherever we are on the line we have water in sight at the bottom of the glass these are the shutdown valves again for the cox rather for the gauge frame and we will leave them in the closed position when we leave the foot plate in a few moments. In the old days men had to go under the firebox at night, clean out all the ashes that had dropped through and as the modernization progressed certain locomotives were fitted with a rocking grate which enabled you to turn two halves of the grate over at 90 degrees, all the ashes would drop through and underneath you had a hopper ash pan. By opening the retaining catch, by putting the bar in, and by moving it across, you will see that all the ashes drop through automatically, thereby ensuring that the one of the dirtiest jobs on disposing a locomotive ceased and more people became interested in disposing of them than previously. Closing the hopper, putting the bolt over, the catch over, and that certainly saved an awful lot of time and dirt for the individual concerned. There are four driving wheels each side of the locomotive and a leading one small wheel on each side making it a 280 locomotive. The rod joining all four driving wheels is known as the coupling rod and is actually split into three sections, one through the knuckle pin here, again on the second driver and again connected to the main driver. Outside the coupling rod is the connecting rod. This is known as the big end of the connecting rod. We work right along it to the little end and in turn to the piston in the cylinder. This is known as the crank and obviously is able to turn in a rotary motion through from the connecting rod itself and the coupling rod. Here we have the expansion link and die block and I'd like to show you what happens when we put the locomotive which is currently in the reverser in mid-gear you can see the block is in the middle of the link just watch as you see the block which is in the mid position drop to the bottom of the lift as we go into full forward gear.
position the drive from the crank is back and over the axle in forward gear. The exact opposite occurs in full reverse gear. The die block goes almost to the top of the link and the crank rides over in the reverse direction as we go tender first down the line. Inside the cylinder cover is the valve chest. Inside is the valve spindle carrying the two piston valves. And on the lower side, lower half, is the cylinder itself carrying the double acting piston. And at this position on the crank, which is in the back quarter, you will see that the piston itself is virtually totally withdrawn and the piston head will be approximately here in the cylinder. As we drive forwards, so steam which has come down the main steam port will come behind the cylinder through the entry port into the cylinder and push the piston to the front of the cylinder. Almost as it gets to the end of the cylinder, the inlet port at the rear will close, the exhaust port at the front will open, chuff out of the chimney for the steam that's still in the cylinder, and the front entry port will begin to open to push the cylinder back again to the rear of the cylinder, making one full revolution on the driving wheel. As we discussed earlier, the drain cocks from the cylinder and the valve chest run through here. And this is the noise that you hear when the locomotive starts off in the morning, when you get a <laughs> with steam blowing through the cocks, again getting rid of the condensate. Finally, if we look on the top of the running board, nothing to do with the motion for the time being, but the two circular caps that you have, one facing us and one a little bit to our right, are the feed pipes for the sanders. And this is where we top up the sanding gear, top up the sand for the sanding gear, check it every day, probably top it up in the winter once a week. We also mentioned earlier on that we had injectors which put water up into the boiler through a clack valve. And you can see the copper pipe from the injector running up the side there of the boiler into the clack valve and the water for the boiler is refilled from the top spot there. 